Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming. This is our premiere showing of the uh, Thrive on Kilimanjaro documentary. And what's exciting about it is, is this was birthed from a campaign we did last year. Uh, absolutely remarkable for Thrive for Good. With it, we raised half a million dollars, which fuels for us putting life gardens in over 5,000 communities. Communities have between 20 and 40 people. It's unbelievable the impact that together, the campaign uh, of the fundraising we did and what it will do. For those of you that are new to Thrive or have never heard of our organization, Thrive for Good, uh, we're a not-for-profit working in countries all around the world, and we focus on food security, teaching and training, and empowering communities how to grow nutritious, healthy, disease-fighting foods. And we do it sustainably. Our work, is impact, our work and impact this year is rapidly scaling uh, through our in, uh, partnerships, which I'm going to talk a little bit later tonight about. But before we go on, we're all here for the premiere showing. So with that, I want to introduce the film and uh, we can watch uh, the documentary. Afterwards, we will have a uh, panel discussion with Nate Slacko, the filmmaker, as well as Dale Bolton, the founder of Thrive. I've had several friends who have done a Kilimanjaro. They said it was the hardest thing they did, but it was also the, the most uh, uh, beautiful. And so um, there's this kind of parallel thing happening where uh, this crazy big mountain uh, that I've been looking at for 15 years, and then we have this crazy thing of wanting to uh, change the lives of 5,000 uh, communities, which is like over the top big. Yeah, there's really several different things that we hope to accomplish in the training center. We really wanted to show them a lifestyle. Uh, a lot of people would come in when they have parasites or they have maybe some blood sugar issues or they're constantly getting sick. And um, we would feed them the best that we growing out of the garden. And at the end of it, they would just say, man, I, I just don't feel as vulnerable. The model that we're working with um, and the four pillars, nutrition, organic gardening, uh, herbal medicine and income generation, our biggest um, problem is really trying to uh, scale uh, the program to the amount of demand. When we started talking about 5,000 uh, life gardens, it just kind of got me excited to do uh, this mountain and um, really um, kind of accomplish the same sort of thing so people would be encouraged. One, two, three, say Kilimanjaro Akuna Matata. Pole, pole. Pole, pole. Me being the oldest person, uh, 68, on the team, uh, I knew I needed to do a little bit of training. And so I probably an hour to an hour and a half a day doing different types of trainings. You have to pour every bit of who you are into this if you're going to make it to the top.
Well, the first day was pretty interesting. You know, we went about uh, 11, 12 kilometers. And um, I, I, it seemed like it was the longest 11, 12 kilometers I've been on and, and I can ever remember. I'm uh, very excited. All the things that I talked about, about you know, it being, you know, this being a challenge and people dealing with challenges all over the world. Um, how do they overcome? Do they, can they keep at it? Ambrose and I have been working together for um, probably 13 years. His mom was one of the first organic farmers in his tribe, the Maasai tribe. The major problem that we had back in the community was people getting sick and food security. This is a problem that is, exists in the country, the whole of Kenya, and even the whole of the continent. In our training center here in Kitale, we invite people from different parts. We take them through an in-person training. They go back to their communities and start establishing some life gardens in their community. So the purpose of the climb was to create awareness about what we are doing with the communities and also raising funds to support life gardens in Africa and the whole world. The other person that we wanted to invite was Joyce, who is just a, an amazing gal, has shown that anybody can rise above poverty and make a significance. We felt that she was a good candidate that uh, can do great uh, uh, work in the organization. Joyce, um, you know, she went from just no knowledge uh, to having 800 garden beds in a women's prison of only 200 women, and a um, lot of obstacles to overcome there. But she did it. All of those things we do in our projects, we, we try to create a, a, this thing of hope for the future and, um, and uh, really try to look at, uh, you know, they just, you just got to keep doing the right things. Uh, the first day was good. Uh, everybody looked energetic and uh, we enjoyed the rainforest. And uh, the last one kilometer was uh, a bit tough as people were exhausted, but we finally made it and everybody was just very okay. So it was a good day. And being the first day, at least we learned a few things on how we should proceed with the next of our, or, or with the rest of the, of the climbing. So it was good. The three principles are one, you have to take enough water, walk slowly by slowly. We say pole pole. And then the third one, you have to eat as much as you can. Since the first day, I think I said this, I've already prepared my mind to be up there. So uh, that's keeping me going, going, going. A real lion never gives up. Today we, are, we started with a lot of energy, but as we go, the higher we go, the tougher it becomes. The walking poles, they have really helped me and they have kept me going. The hard part for me is to stay present 
emotionally and spiritually because sometimes you're so absorbed in your own just you know pain and exhaustion and remembering that you can fail and being grateful for uh, each day and each step So today, starting to here to here, yeah, well, up to Lava Tower, 4,600 meters, and then go down 3,900 feet, call name is the Barranco. The higher we go, the cooler it becomes. And uh, the thing that helped me so much, I carried my Maasai sheet. So I wrapped myself inside, then I entered the sleeping bag. In the morning, I was somehow chilly but now i'm feeling confident because i see the sun has just rose and uh, it's getting warmer so i know we will make it to where the, to the next camp yeah i think everybody really um, had a day or two that were a little tougher than others joyce who is just uh, an amazing gal uh, she uh, kind of developed some cold symptoms and was losing energy it uh, just shows you the resilience in the body what the body can accomplish is like beyond the average person's understanding. It was cold. Um, Chad left some water outside and it was frozen in the morning. So it's just basically innovating and trying to get it going. And uh, But the good news is we get 11 hours in the tent and so it's just kind of, you know, you just make it up over the long haul. This weather is such a gift. It's great. I looked at kind of the third day at the mountain and I thought, how in the world are we gonna get up there? All I could do is just move my feet forward, knowing that I was running pretty close on E. And yet everybody was there. Everybody was kind of moving forward. You never could really tell where the camps were. It, they, they just seemed to be over the next hill. It was really, um, great to be at the uh, camp at the end of the day. That was the thing that really you looked forward to. After we ran out of vegetation, every day was pretty challenging because the oxygen levels were dropping. And so for myself, it wasn't so much huge highs and lows. It was just this thing of how are we going to get past the next 500 feet? And so this forced you to be in the moment and be aware of what was going on around you. Yeah, the Bronco Wall is really the um, kind of unknown entity in the whole trip because it, um, it looks and is kind of scary. It's the vertical part, hand over hand uh, climbing. Below us, the whole horizon is covered with clouds. The only thing that I think would have stopped us was an injury. Careful, careful. Yeah. Don't shake, don't shake. Okay? Huh? Don't shake. Don't shake. 
There you go. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh, thank you. <laughs> For me, the fourth and the fifth day were probably the hardest in which um, I had pushed everything at, at this thing. You know, I was doing a lot of meditative stuff. I was doing a lot of praying. That was like totally adrenaline, man. Like, oh. Uh, I just did it like uh, drinking a cup of tea. I tell you, I was praying and I was um, taking it literally one step at a time. Everybody was super supportive. It was like so uh, neat to be kind of walking together, knowing the, the physical necessities of climbing Kilimanjaro is one thing, but getting the headspace and having the right people to climb with you, you know, and just say, we're in this thing together and, and we're gonna enjoy it. That was the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, it was down. steep, but uh, it was awesome. I did not die, and so I consider it a victory. Um, it teaches you about the healthy side of fear. And I'm very grateful that we're up here and um, we only have 1,600 meters to go, so. That was the toughest experience. So when I was climbing, my knees were like shaking, but I was grateful making it up. You know, you start off with making like a two foot stride, then it goes down to a foot and a half stride, then a foot stride, and then eight inches. And you want to just keep that going all the time. It was a huge meditative time for me. It's the end of a long day, but we'll get there. 100 more meters. very tired you see like today we did two days in one towards the end i felt like giving up and sitting down <laughs> but i thank god he has given he has given me the energy to reach the camp and i am so grateful right now we can see the last path that we'll be taking tomorrow very early in the morning to reach the peak and then go back I kind of regret that I haven't done this earlier in life. Not because I'm tired, but because it's an amazing experience. It's, it's really hard to define pushing yourself beyond the limit and just said, yeah, life can be this strong and big. You're, you're using every bit of energy just to breathe. And you're moving very slow. Like the supply of oxygen at that stellar point was not good. I was feeling nausea. I, I felt like maybe I'm going to give up. But uh, the guys that we were with, I felt encouraged and I felt I, I'd make it.
Done. It's important to learn what your pace actually is, even yeah. if it's a lot slower than you think it ought to be. Because it's sustainable, and the main thing is you get to the goal. And we did. It was totally freaking awesome. One, two, three, Kelly! Kelly. One, two, three, Thrive! Yeah. One, two, three, Amazing Guy! Amazing Guy! And one, two, three, we're heading home! We're, we're heading, heading home. home, it's all downhill. Here I am. Hey. I'm good. I'm energetic. Very good. Yeah? You know, I was doing a lot of meditative stuff. I was doing a lot of praying, and um, uh, that seemed to be a real resource to me. But uh, I was actually so surprised at how encouraging uh, the team were for each other, just quietly, all of us walking together. Uh, it was like a team, and it was uh, such an amazing sort of sense of, of uh, trying to do it together. Oh, it was a great team. Uh, I did love the team. It was a strong team and we kept on uh, encouraging each other and that's why all of us made to the top and uh, and uh, they were everybody was very excited once we made to the top so i can say it was a great team we had the old the middle age uh, the young so we did very well we did very well Kilimanjaro taught me something that every journey starts with a step and there is nothing that is impossible. In life, you have to utilize the opportunity that you've got. And as Thrive for Good and as I'm work I've been working for Thrive for Good, I really, that I really think that this is a very great opportunity to work in such an environment. I just see so much potential in Africa, as we've said a number of times, that 25% of the best farmland in the world is in Africa and 80% is not used. That's why personally I feel whatever we are doing and going organically or growing foods organically is the best way to go because it will solve most of these problems with health, health issues and also the depletion of the soil. The hope that I have in the future for my kids, our families and our communities is that they'll come to understand or they'll grow uh, uh, getting this knowledge and then they can uh, grow healthy and also live longer because at least with this kind of knowledge it is it is giving hope that people can just live along by having healthy food and also uh, doing uh, or farming the right way. Boy, that's uh, a little bit emotional for me even watching that. Um, boy, if I could rock an afro like that today. <laughs> this is me 17 years ago after uh, I climbed to Kilimanjaro. This is on day two. Um, I'll tell you, it climbing Kilimanjaro is probably the most punishing thing I've ever done. It literally, as they mentioned in what you saw in the film, it literally takes everything out of you. It pushes you to that brink. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be exciting hearing from both Nate and Dale as they, uh, as they climbed it. 
Uh, I remember the last day as I summited, unfortunately, I, I went by myself, and the last day summiting, it was uh, nighttime the whole way, and probably halfway through, I, I passed out. It was snowing and head first in the ground, and Erebo picks me up, and he's looking at me in the eyes, and if he's got to send me back down or if I can finish, and it's just, it's, it's grueling. It's so rewarding, though, um, when you get to the top. So with that, I want to invite uh, to come on up uh, Dale Bolton. Uh, Dale is the founder of Thrive, visiting from Toronto. Uh, Dale is the founder of Thrive. I met three, four years ago. Uh, the brainchild of our, which we'll learn more about tonight, the methodology of everything Thrive does. Absolute incredible man, humble, just an honor and pleasure to work with. I also want to invite Nate Slacko. Nate is the uh, filmmaker. I don't know how in the world, after doing it myself, Nate, you filmed that. <laughs> so Nate has done, uh, he's passionate about culture. He's pass about, passionate about sharing stories about human conditions. Uh, Nate's done multiple uh, films for CBC and just an awesome guy uh, that I've got to know uh, since we started. Um, Dale, I'm gonna start with you. We'll uh, we got you know 20 minutes to hear from you guys about your experience. Uh, this is awesome. You don't get to see the photos we get to show of you. <laughs> um, so with that, Dale, a question for you is: Tell about the inspiration. Uh, you were the initial kind of impetus and inspiration for I think this campaign, this whole event, using Kilimanjaro and getting to the top um, for Thrive and what we're doing. Where does this passion come from? Where did it come from to do this? Um, it's interesting. It's about a 15-year journey that we've been on, and but it even goes back farther than that. Um, I, the first time I um, traveled outside of Canada, I was staying in, this, in, in the Caribbean, and I was staying in this big hotel, and um, I always liked to walk. And um, I, looked, I was in like the 17th floor and looking over the balcony, and, we were in the back of the building and I looked out the back and there were some buildings down there and I thought, well, that's interesting. I'll go see that in the morning, do a little exploring. Got up the next morning, went directly behind the building and there were just some, just, you know, stuff that we would consider broken down chicken coops. And it turned out like there was a family of eight living in there. And here I am living in probably the most opulent place I'd ever been in. And right behind it were these people living in the most abject poverty. And there's just something that in me that just said, this is wrong, like, this is really wrong. And we, I grew up on a farm and we wouldn't even put animals in these buildings. And, um, and so uh, fast forward 50 years, um, here I am uh, working with an organization I think has the ability to create some traction in terms of ending extreme poverty. And so in 2004, we went to, uh, we heard that there were 40 million orphans in the uh, continent of Africa. And that, I don't know what it was. It was just like I ran into a wall. And with that, I, I, I just thought, that's more than the population of Canada, unsupported children. And so we went over and we saw a whole bunch of um, children in, in different uh, communities, went over to Malawi. And um, I thought, we have to do something about this. I, you know, I was kind of finished a second career and was looking at maybe slowing down. I thought, I'm going to be sitting you know, somewhere where it's very comfortable in my semi-retirement. And these 40 million kids are just, it just won't leave me alone. And so we went over there and, and uh, started doing, uh, my wife has a company. Uh, this is Linda over there. Do everyone want to say hi to Linda there? And uh, she's really so much of uh, this journey. We haven't heard anything from her, but she actually started a company at the same time we developed this passion to do something in Africa. And with the funding from that company, uh, we've been able to do things over the last 15 years. And it first started with just doing orphanages and drilling water wells and building schools. But the more we went to visit projects, we, the more we realized everywhere we went where they were working with orphan care organizations, they were asking for money for food. And I thought, this is really weird. At that time, I mentioned I grew up on a farm. My dad's 85, and he's still growing a third of his own food. And the growing conditions are better. I tell him I can't take my dad to Africa. He'd be too jealous of how easy it is to grow food where he has to restart a garden every year. And so um, that was the beginning of it and saying, if we could just create food security, and that was about 2008. And then we realized 
that we can't just grow food. We've got to grow food that really builds immune function because there's cholera, typhus, TB, pneumonia, dysentery, malaria, meningitis, not even talking about Ebola and HIV. And so we brought in naturopathic doctors and holistic nutritionists, and they said, if you grow these 50 plants um, you know, in different locations, that is going to keep these people healthy. And so we started doing that. We added a herbal medicine component to it. And so the convergence of organic gardening, nutrition, and herbal medicine just made this thing so powerful. For probably about 10 years, I wanted to shout it from a mountain somewhere. And so um, I'd heard of Jamie going to Kilimanjaro. I'd heard of other people. And, and um, really, Mark, who uh, had talked to us about you know, you guys need to do something large, something really big, the biggest thing you've ever done. And uh, so that came together as this idea of climbing it. It was uh, just, you know, it's something that um, the potential is like mountain top. And we needed, you know, a visual expression of that. That's awesome. Yeah, it's... Uh... You're right, just the connectedness and the challenge of like something, you know, I remember those conversations of something so big, right? And Kilimanjaro would fit that bill. Uh, Nate, question for you. When uh, I remember, I should remember where I was when I first called you, got your contact that you could potentially do a documentary for us. And I remember phoning you saying, so we're leaving on a trip in like two months. <laughs> Uh, would you be interested in doing a documentary for us? And by the way, you have to hike Kilimanjaro, make it up to the top, and film while you're doing it. <laughs> when I made, first made that phone call from you, what did you imagine this was going to be like? And afterwards, when you were done, what's the biggest impact that this had on you doing this? Um, I think initially, like, doing documentaries, I get in the habit of just saying yes to stuff like that that falls in my lap so that's how it started and then after that you kind of face the realization the reality of it and you're shooting eight days without power in a tent and figuring out how that all works uh so yeah there's like a bit of you know reality kicks in and you have to do a little bit of problem solving but uh yeah everything worked out and I'm not sure what my biggest takeaway was. Like honestly, like we, it was a it was a big challenge. But I think we can all say like our team was so strong, and in such good moods or overall good moods. Like, everyone had their down days and stuff like that. But overall, we just kept each other in like such good spirits, and we lucked out with weather as well. Oh, so. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah, I think we got lucky, but overall, like I'd say, like gratitude. I think like it was just I'm grateful for everyone and the whole experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, let's go there for a minute. I mean, Dale, you know, it clearly was evident in the film, and it's not something I can relate to. As I mentioned, climbing it myself, and uh, I think it's just even for society in the world today of going it alone, right? Um, and what that's like compared to doing it as a team. I mean, to that extent, Dale, it became so clear in the in the film. I mean, maybe talk a little bit more about that, how it translated for you guys as uh, doing it together as a team. Yeah, I've been working with uh, teams for, you know, all my working life. and, and uh, But it, it just became so, um, like, the difference between, you know, living and dying. Like, someone could fall and someone could uh, really hurt themselves. And so just the energy of sensing that there are six people who are totally with you uh, was um, so large for me. It was just I, I'd never experienced that before. I, I'm sure it happened as we had done other projects in the past, but you know, nobody went faster than the slowest person. And we were all uh, there supportive and uh, you know, someone just hit a wall, we'd pray with them for a few minutes and then um, and then everything was fine, and we'd keep moving. And and uh, uh, and you know, I had never met Nate before, and and like you know, he everybody else knew each other, and we he just kind of fit right in, and and you know, uh, you know, was able to make fun of a lot of things that were difficult, 
And uh, this guy was amazing, like carrying the camera equipment and filming it. I'm just trying to get my butt up the mountain, and he's going around, you know. And uh, and and I thought, wow, this is almost supernatural, you know. Yeah, that was uh, probably one of the biggest takeaways with hearing the film and watching it tonight. John Putnam, board member at Thrive, hearing him say, "This this mountain and this experience, it's going to teach you about pace. You got to learn your pace." Because your pace is sustainable. Like that, that was just like, what a takeaway. Killy will teach you that, right? You can't go too fast. Um, Nate, last question for you. Um, after climbing, I mean, here you are, 20,000 feet, highest freestanding mountain in the world. You helped raise funds telling a story for 5,000 uh, Life Gardens communities. 100, over 100,000 people we can support. After doing this, what did you feel and experience of taking that and then now actually going to communities in Kenya, the communities that Thrive works in, in Katawe, and what you visited? Because now you can tangibly feel the impact and the difference. What was that like and what did you feel? Yeah, I think that was really interesting because we started the trip off. I, I met Dill at uh, an airport somewhere in Europe and then we just basically jumped right into the Kilimanjaro trip. Uh, but after that, we went up to Katale in Kenya to visit the training center and all these different uh, garden projects there. And that's what really kind of brought it home for me. It's just actually seeing, uh, I th yeah, I, th I think like sometimes c people can talk a big game and they're really about, uh, you know, selling the idea of what they do, but actually being there and seeing what was happening and uh, the sense of ownership within the community and with these people and like, giving, yeah, letting them be in charge of this. It was really special to see, and it, like, it really struck a chord with me, so, yeah. Yeah, I, with that, I, I can resonate. When I first, also, when I first met Dale, not in an airport, but on a phone call, <laughs> and talking and hearing about uh, Thrive, and the project, and the, the method, and the model, and the approach that was taken, I remember just totally taken aback, and, uh, like you say, kind of put in your mouth where it is and not sure what I thought. Uh, and I was just, I had to go visit this myself. Uh, I was uh, with family. Yeah, I was actually uh, going to be traveling to South Africa to visit family. And uh, in the conversation, I said, you know what, when I'm down in South Africa, I'll dust off the backpack, I'll throw it on, head up to Kenya, go check it out, spending three days at the training center, going and seeing the projects, uh, that the, the communities that Thrive works in, from schools, churches, uh, prisons. Uh, it was absolutely unbelievable, actually. And I think also knowing how few funds are required to buy the tools, seeds, and supplies to support a community and seeing the impact, the impact. And I've actually never seen healthier people in my entire life. I, the, the, the food, the ability to walk out into a garden collect the food that you need for the day, these plant-based green leaf, you know, herbs and vegetables and make meals out of it. It's amazing. I've literally never met healthier people. And the community members that I spoke with and talk, talked with, for them, you know, saying, yeah, I used to suffer from malaria, like suffer bedridden two weeks, suffer from malaria three, four times a year. I haven't been sick in over 10 years, right? Because of just changing diet and eating and getting proper nutrition and diseases, they just don't have the impact anymore. It was overwhelming when I visited the communities to see the impact and the hope that's offered. For sure. And I was only there for a week, but we ate very well when we were there. We had some really good, healthy meals, so. It was kind of interesting, I mentioned, if I can jump in here, Jamie, when we, we came in 2004, there were 40 million orphans. But every year, there were one to two more million orphans being added to that grand total because of malnutrition. Today, there's 60 million orphans uh, in the continent of Africa. Um, and um, I'm healthier there than I am anywhere. Uh, I would spend two to three months a year there um, since 2004, except for the two years in COVID. And um, it was um, just, you know, just so encouraging to see our community say no i haven't i haven't i haven't had any sickness they would be afraid two to three times a year they would get something that 
they were wondering if it was going to take them out. And, uh, <clears throat> and so, you know, part of the thing is, is that everybody hears, uh, you know, from all different uh, walks of life. But I really encourage you to grab onto some problem that is so big and just, you know, every day look for a way to impact that. Because over the last, uh, like, 18 years, I think we've got a toehold prior to doing this project in 2004. I've, I've been working in developing countries for 40 years. And I'd try some things and, you know, it, it kind of worked, but it never really got the traction. This thing has created the most traction I've ever seen. And I kind of jokingly say it's really ruined my retirement, just absolutely ruined it. <laughs> because for such a little amount of effort and encouragement, we can take on another country. We can do this, we can go into this region, we can take on this country. And because it's all transferable, everything is digital now. We are a whole one month seminar, it's online. We're getting it done in uh, places we I never even dreamed of, I, didn't, I don't even know of. And, uh, and so at, you know, doing this thing in Kilimanjaro was just an extension of working with people over that 18 years and seeing something come together that was so solid and way bigger than my wife and I. And just seeing Africans so excited that they don't have to have cholera or typhus or TB or pneumonia or dysentery. And, um, and uh, we, have one, we have one herb called Artemisia annua. And it grows in, in hotter climates. Uh, and if you take the leaves from it and make it into a tea, it'll completely kill parasites. Mm -hmm. And that's what causes malaria. Malaria is a parasite. And it's, that's not the only parasite in Africa. They've got all kinds of waterborne parasites. And so, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm healthier there than I am anywhere. And in many ways, I think I've received more than I've actually given. Because I feel, you know, I'll be 70 in nine months. And if my wife would let me, I'd go climb the mountain again. <laughs> but she said, no, you're not doing that again. <clears throat> and so um, it's, it's just been so rewarding and so uh, incredible to see the impact of working together with people over a long period of time and taking on things that are way bigger than we as individuals are. Wow, gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for sharing and uh, sharing your experience. Hey, thank you for doing that. Um, yeah, and just it's so good to share what Thrive is doing and the reason why and the story of Kilimanjaro. Right, we also have some sheets of, um, uh, of people who have come to, to uh, Kenya with us. And so if there are people here who want to take um, a, a discovery uh, tour, we do take uh, teams. We'll probably be going in January with the team now that the, we're on the other side of COVID, and um, and so um, we'd love to bring people and people uh, who really say something in me wants to make a difference there, and so uh, we'd encourage that. And um, I love just talking to everybody. There's some people who've taken our online gardening program and they're here for the very first time, and um, there's probably. 20 or 30 people in that group, and uh, we'd love to show the documentary to them uh, once we get kind of a, uh, these two showings done. So awesome. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. We really want to talk about um, this is actually a, a Thrive Online Garden Academy. We've had so many people asking us about our training and uh, how it relates to, is it available for North Americans? It's had so much impact in developing countries. So over the last six months, we have rapidly worked to put all of our training into, uh, transpose it into the context for North Americans. We did a soft launch two weeks ago. We've already had 2,000 people sign up for online training. It's 46 courses, uh, 46 videos. Unbelievable, two and a half hours, really well done. So this is uh, tonight is kind of the first public announcement of the Academy. And I really just want to encourage, you know, if you're interested in gardening, if you know people, family that lives out in East or in the suburbs, if there's an interest in gardening, it is fascinating. Uh, the back end of the course has 23 videos on nutrition. We're going to we'll just watch a real quick uh, 60, 90 second tra a teaser uh, trailer on the, uh, the Academy of what it is and what to expect. 
Many people are growing their own food these days to save some money or to get better flavor. And those are great reasons, but I've noticed that not many people are talking about what to me is a, a very important reason, that with a little know-how, it's possible to grow food that's many times more nutritious than any food you can buy in the grocery store. And that nutrition can go a long way to preventing everyday illnesses like the common cold and the flu, and even the leading causes of death like heart disease and cancer. Growing a little food isn't that hard, but growing food that is nutrient dense enough to really improve your health requires more knowledge. And that's why we created this new online video course where you learn step by step how to create your own organic garden in any climate. We've taught these methods around the world to everyone from small children to older adults. We start with the soil, making it not only suitable for plants, but really optimal for growing highly nutritious plants. And then we choose the most nutritious types of plants to grow. We place them so they help each other grow better. We may get our hands on some seeds or some plants and we plant them out in the garden. And by summer, we're harvesting fresh vegetables and herbs and we're putting nutritious organic meals on the table. So my name is Phil. I'm the gardener who created this course. And if you'd like to do all of these things, we've decided for now to give you free access to the whole course. You can just click down below to get in there right now. With this, we're thrilled to be offering for now the, the course away for free. We did a competitive analysis on average gardening courses, 250 bucks. Uh, we believe so wholeheartedly in, uh, in what we have to offer for it. So it's exciting actually being able to offer all this for, you know, in North America. We'll just quickly end on the back end of talking about Thrive and, you know, the documentary and the campaign last year and this year growing our impact. I, I was with a group of friends last night and I haven't seen them in six months. And, you know, it was amazing kind of catching up and just talking about how we're doing. And I kind of shared, I, last couple of months, I've been frustrated. I've been at this point of tension and, you know, kind of sharing, I mean, we got war, we got the Ukraine, we got Russia, there's inflation. We got problems with wheat, fertilizer, potash. There's a serious problem brewing for the future. and. Uh, I, I spent so much of my time working in food security and especially in developing countries. It's one thing for us that our groceries go up a certain percentage. It's one thing that, you know, our, our food bills are a little bit more expensive, but it's a whole nother thing for, you know, I take a country of Rwanda, you know, somebody like Oscar, all of a sudden, you know, for him who used to be able to have two meals a day and now he's down to one. The United Nations says that here in the next 24 months, Food's going to go up 10 to 35% in developing countries. Ethiopia is already over 35% food inflation. It's frustrating. And I think that's where, for, for me, it kind of translates into how much hope can be with what Thrive has to offer and what we're doing. There's this element about growing food and teaching communities how to grow it sustainably. And there's a shelter from a storm with that. Uh, last year, we par partnered with an uh, organization called Food for the Hungry. Food for, we did a pilot project and a pilot project of training 24 uh, staff within their organization. We launched in four countries, one we never even had trainers go to. We did the whole thing virtually and online. And we launched in 47 communities. And it's amazing that an organization like Food for the Hungry, they spent $45,000 launching all these community projects that now impact over 5,000 people. Today, that those communities are growing 10 times as much money in food. They're growing half a million dollars a year in food that they would have had to buy. And that's the type of partnerships that Thrive is forming that's fueling this expansion. We um, currently to, to today, Thrive is working with 95, almost 95,000 people in over 700 communities. Together, these communities, so you can see, we, we love data and analytics and tracking impact. Currently, our communities are producing 15 million meals of food, which is seven and a half million dollars. And again, we offer this first seed concept where we fund and we fuel a community. And after that, they grow sustainably. I talked about earlier how we're growing 
at a rapid pace, and we're doing it through three uh, through partnerships. We've got three major partnerships that we're launching here in the next 12 months. And it's exciting, as Dale was talking about, we're working in countries that he doesn't even know about. We're launching this year in Tanzania. We're launching in India. Actually, I got a video today. First, we broke ground this morning in India. Uh, it was so exciting to watch and just see the different climate and culture and people. We're launching in India. We launched in Southern Africa uh, about four months ago. And so we're fueling through partnerships to do this. Over the next three years, through partnerships, we're literally gonna uh, rapidly scale our impact. Through the partnerships, we'll be doing, you know, impacting over 1.5 million people in 50,000 communities. Uh, it's absolutely fascinating to think it's $60 million of uh, food per month. As I mentioned earlier tonight, the world is in a global food crisis. The next couple of years, I really believe we're gonna see an unprecedented time where so many communities, especially those in the global south and developing countries, they're gonna see food insecurity um, at a rate they've never seen. And it's at Thrive for Good, we believe we, we have an ability and a way uh, where we can provide uh, for people in a sustainable way, as we mentioned. And the impact can be tremendous. So later, we actually are announcing tonight and we're starting off a, a campaign this year. We're calling it the Going Global Fundraising Campaign. Similar to what we did last year as we had a team out uh, going to climb Kilimanjaro in, in solidarity with them, we put together a fundraising campaign that, that ultimately supports the expansion of life gardens around the world. And that's why we're calling it Going Global. With that, I want to I want to just quickly show and talk about the virtual Kilimanjaro campaign. The way it essentially works is we put together uh, an ultimate campaign that we're gonna we're we're targeting to raise a hundred thousand dollars, of which we've got an anonymous donor that's that's willing to match up to that. So for every dollar that is raised and or donated, it gets doubled. And with the campaign, we it's it's called a peer to peer campaign. We encourage people to go out and start a team. And when you have a team, essentially you're rallying behind. Pick pick a number, whether you want to raise five hundred dollars, maybe seven hundred and fifty dollars, and you get your friends, your neighbors, your family to donate to it. And as a team, you compete. We compete against each other. Last year, we had multiple prizes from a trip to Kenya. We had a, a one-week stay at a penthouse suite in a Soyuz, British Columbia. And basically what we're competing for is while the team is hiking Kilimanjaro in person in September, we are uh, competing as well. We're walking steps. We are, uh, some people go run, some people do elevation uh, climbing. And we report all of this and feed it back. And I want to encourage everybody tonight, be part of this campaign. Be part of what we're doing. I encourage you to start a team. We're going to provide the link. Um, very simple and easy to start a team. And from there, get people to join you. Join your team. And if you're not interested in join, you know, making a team or if you're not interested in starting one, I encourage you to donate. With our Going Global campaign and the opportunity we have for a $100,000 matching grant, we can start so many life gardens uh, impacting communities in multiple different countries. I encourage you to donate from what you saw tonight, uh, what you experienced, be a part of this. So with that, I just want to thank everybody for coming out uh, and being a part of it, seeing the documentary, hearing more about Thrive and what we do. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this.